banks take the money and run, and God of War devouring more and more. Coming up on today's Citizens Report. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 26th of January 2023. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robbie Barwick. Welcome. Thanks, Elisa. On today's show, we're going to be talking about how the banks are heading off with taxpayers and depositors' money and giving nothing back. And then we'll discuss the latest developments on the international war front and push for global NATO, including in this region. Don't forget to hit the like button to get the um, video circulating. Subscribe and ring the notifications bell and we'll keep you posted of any updates and share this as widely as you can across social media. Um, now, we got any updates before we get into the meat and potatoes? Yes, the uh, ASIC inquiry that uh, was taking submissions with a deadline of the 3rd of February has now extended that deadline to the 28th of February, which is um, an important extension. This is because this is going to be an 18 month inquiry. What they needed to do is make sure that, you know, there was plenty of time post the, the Christmas New Year hiatus for people to get themselves organised to put in good submissions. So that's, that's now the 28th of February. Um, uh, we'll talk a bit more about ASIC in a second, I'm sure. Uh, uh, make sure you spread the word and make sure you make submissions if you've had an experience with ASIC. Yes, and the other marching orders we will pass on very shortly because our first topic is going to relate to our other major campaign, which is to seize or halt the regional bank closures and get a postal bank to solve that problem. So banks take the money and run. Um, so this is not a new thing, of course, but... No. It's escalating by the day because the, the framework, the system upon which the banks depend is collapsing. It has been collapsing for a long time uh, and it's about to cave in on itself. Now, we put out a press release this week, which we'll put up on the screen, and it talked about the latest... There's been more media coverage. We talked about this in the first show back for the year. Um, over the Christmas period, there was actually quite a bit of attention coming from the major media to the plight of regional communities that are losing, many of them, their last bank branch. Uh, and the figures we put out in the media release uh, is that since the 30th of September last year, 79 regional branch closures were announced. That's just in regional communities. Now, the Sydney Morning Herald had an article on the 21st of January. They reported that 700 branches have shut in three years. Um, there was also attention to the ATM closures mm. on uh, Sky News the other day, they reported that ATMs have been slashed by 53% in five years and that over the last eight years, a total, the total number of ATMs has dropped from 31,000 to just 6,400. This is a war on cash, yes. Elisa, and people need to enlist. We'll talk about a real war later, but people... We're, people need to enlist in this war, mm. fight back in the war on cash. And so the latest uh, media coverage was this Sydney Morning Herald article, which was headlined, Where Are All the Local Bank Branches? And uh, it quoted uh, the FSU uh, head, Julia Angrisano, saying that this is the fastest rate of closures since the wave that took place in the 1990s. Um, she said, such as the speed, or this, the Sydney Morning Herald said, such as the speed of the closures that it has sparked warnings about the potential impact on members of the community who rely on branches as an essential service. And they went into quite a bit of detail about that. Um, and Angrisano said that claims that this is all customer driven, the banks are just following the lead of the fact that the customers aren't coming to the bank branches is disingenuous. Of course, we've shown that before on the show. Um, Banks, she said, have been given or they've given the staff targets to get people or force people to go digital, essentially. Yep. Now, the other thing that happened this week was that Ben Fordham from 2GB Radio put out a Facebook post saying basically he'd been inundated with people contacting him about particularly ATM closures in that case. 
Uh, and this is what his post said. He said, I'd be keen for some specific examples of where this is suddenly an issue. We're getting a lot of messages about ATMs. They have either disappeared or been replaced by the generic machines that charge you 2 to $3 a transaction. New data shows the number of ATMs has more than halved since 2017. The banks have also shut down more than 1,600 branches. The Reserve Bank says this is due to a sharp reduction in the number of cash with withdrawals, but there are still many, many people who rely on cash, particularly in regional areas. This is not customer service. Mm. And he appealed for people to share their concerns. He invited people to comment under his Facebook post or to email him. And you should do so at ben at 2gb.com to share their concerns or their stories. And we'll link to the Facebook post below, uh, Mr. Producer, uh, because it would be good. Like, you yeah. need to... The, 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 here's the, what's happening. I want people to understand this. By definition, the banks are lying because the banks are saying, and every media report starts off with, um, people are moving away from cash. People are moving away from using branches as if people are initiating this, mm. right? If that were true, we wouldn't have a campaign. If that were true, the media wouldn't be detecting the anger that's brewing in the community, mm. right? So they're detecting a real problem out there because it's not true. We need them to stay engaged in it though. And that's where when someone like, you know, 2GB is the biggest radio station in the country, right? So when, when Ben Fordham um, does that, please go and engage with him on Facebook and by email so that they start covering this because in two weeks' time, when Parliament resumes, we want to get a real inquiry into this, one that's no holds barred, roll up your sleeves, take the gloves off, force the banks to account for what they're doing. Mm. So in reality, what the shift is, that is taking place is happening because the banks are initiating it. They close branches and therefore people can't go to the branch and are forced online. They close the, the closest ATM, yep. which you've just walked to, and so you walk home and you do without cash. So that, and you can see that, I think last last week's show, you showed some of Dale Webster from the regional's Twitter feed. I mean, look at the story, story after story. This is the reality that was presented at the Regional Banking Task Force. The story is banks, they still exist in a regional town, even if they don't have a branch. They'll take your money, but they will run. They are not going to stay there to keep the to money in the you. local community and to yeah. service local businesses and to provide floats, to provide cash for people that need it. They'll take it and run. So we need to replace them with someone who will do the job. The post offices won't be leaving town. We need a postal bank to take up that role of customer yep. service and the actual reality of what banking represents if as the, the lifeblood of a community. The banks have made it crystal clear they don't want to serve customers. Good. Let's have a government bank. It'll require a bit of government money to start it up, just a little bit, not as much as a normal bank would because the branch is already there, 4,300 post offices around Australia. Um, but enough money to start this thing and then it's self-funding. It'll pay back the government injection of money straight away mm. really fast. It will be self-funding and it's filling a niche that banks, by their own actions, don't want to provide anyway. But they're going to fight it tooth and nail because what they don't want more than anything else is having to compete with an option that will show them they're full of it. Mm. They're lying because the people that will flock to this bank because they want branch services, because they want to use cash, mm -hmm. and will, will make the bank's claims look absolutely silly. That's right. And in other interesting reflections of this reality, um, that 7.30 report that came out just before Christmas, mm. which was prompted by um, the Kanama and Council. WA yep. and Juni in New South Wales. Um, so they did a brief story about the plight of these regional towns that are losing their last branch. Well, we got a report back, some feedback, that the 7.30 reporter on that show was inundated with phone calls and emails and so forth after that show of similar people and communities facing the same problem. So that's another indication. There's been more and more reports of people affected by scams. And I mean, we as a political party have a lot of interface with people, you know, across all layers of the community. And we're getting reports every single day of our supporters and activists, people they know telling us that they have been scammed. Now, one, one of them is a really long-term supporter of ours in, in regional Queensland. This is a great story because it shows you the danger of the scam, but what the solution is. So she 
she did the wrong thing. She got sucked into authorizing money to um, be paid. That she then she realized, oh, this is a scam. I shouldn't have done it. This woman was able to call up her local bank. Mm -hmm. I think after hours, Mm. she got the manager on the phone who she knew. They knew each other. The manager said, well, I don't know if there's anything I can do. But because he knew her, she didn't have to go and do, she didn't have to wait for two hours online like some story reported this week. Mm. Some guy... Some guy is seeing himself getting getting money taken out of his account. Yep. He's, he calls the banks to say stop it. He gets put on hold for two hours. He has enough time to drive to the police station and he's showing the cops the money being taken out of his account while he's still on hold with the bank for two hours. Right? They won't even provide the backroom support, these bastards. Banks are bastards. But in this particular case, because this is a country town in Queensland, our friend's case, our supporter's case, she knew the manager. He was able to perform a virtual miracle. He got, he put a stop on her money. By that time, he ended yep. up in Turkey or somewhere. And then he was able to get it reversed yeah. because she was able to get this dealt with Soon so enough. quickly. Mm. Right? Because the combination of the branch was there, the manager was there, they knew each other because that's how, that's how banks are supposed to work in the community. It all worked. Whereas what most people are experiencing is the opposite. Mm. And this story about the poor guy, he is watching himself be robbed and he's powerless because he's on hold with a bank that won't answer the phone. Yeah. And it's all your fault. The banks want everything their own way. It's all your fault. Yeah, and that bank, that, that lady called and spoke to the bank manager, it's only a matter of time before it shuts down as various well, that's right. authorities and politicians are saying there won't be any bank branches in 10 years or the fat I think cats, that's being generous. The fat cats at these AGMs that Michael Sanderson went to before Christmas will be looking at her branch and planning its execution as we speak and that ability mm. then gets completely mm. taken away. Even though in the case of the... the um, the RSL at Molong in New South Wales, they made a submission to the Regional Banking Task Force and about what a devastating, devastating impact the loss of their bank, the Commonwealth Bank, has been on them. And she reported, the person who made the submission reported that a top CBA executive had come to town and admitted the branch was profitable. Mm. And they still shut it down anyway, right? So take the money and run yep. is... There's two aspects to this, Elisa. Yeah, not to get you more rolled up. Oh, the about other to. Aspect. The, the one aspect is you put your money in the bank and they, don't get, they give nothing back to you in terms of actual service. But here's the bigger one, if you're not mad already. So Michael West Media, now we already were aware of this. We've talked about this and we've been telling people. And we've used the figure on the phone. We've used the figure in the last few months in this forum and on Martin North, etc. There's a thing called the, the TFF, which is the... Term funding, term facility. funding facility that the Fed, that the RBA, which is taxpayer owned, set up for the banks in 2020 um, in an emergency conditions of COVID, etc. And they allowed the banks to borrow $180 billion from this facility before they eventually stopped the borrowing aspect, but the banks have been able to keep this money. And it's borrowed money, but they borrowed it at either, at first the, the original interest rate was 0.25%, and then the RBA dropped it to 0.1%. And Jared Rennick, Senator Jared Rennick asked the RBA these questions last year, which we played on this show, where the RBA admitted that this is free money to the banks because the banks are able to, are able to they've got this money, $180 billion between them all, 70% the big four, mm. and they're able to either lend that out at commercial rates, which is now 5 plus percent, 6%, 7%. Remember, they're paying 0.1 or 0.25%, so they get that whole spread. Mm-hmm. Or... If they want it risk-free, literally risk-free, a total gift, they can park the money overnight with the RBA for 3.25%. Back with the RBA. So they borrowed from the RBA 0.25 or 0.1, and they get to park it back with the RBA overnight for... for, um, Money for nothing. Money for nothing. So Michael West Media has broken it down. We use the figure um, $5 to $6 billion, but it's it's better to think of it this other way. This is $100 million a week 
free money for the banks, $100 million a week. So that's just the interest that they're that's earning what they're earning from it. each week of that money they've yeah. borrowed and re-lent or reinvested. That's what they're earning from this massive amount of money they're able to borrow. $100 million a week, which is 50 weeks in a year, 52 weeks in a year, it's over $5 billion. Elisa, that's five... Now, um, the banks themselves report, and I think that Sydney Morning Herald article reported it, mm -hmm. it costs a bank around a million dollars mm -hmm. to pay for a branch a year. That's the cost of running a branch a year, one million dollars. And that's, that would be your average small branch, not one of the bigger ones in the, C, in the center of the CBD. Your average small branch, a million dollars, right? A million dollars is, um, the, the, so I, I, I don't want people to lose me and I, I don't want to lose myself in, in my figures, but so if they're getting $100 million a week, mm -hmm. $5,000 million a year, which is what five billion is, five thousand million. Mm -hmm. The federal, the money that they're getting from the government as a free gift would pay for five thousand bank branches in Australia a year. That's more than the total number of bank branches left. Mm. The taxpayer is giving the bank a gift right now that covers the cost of every bank branch in Australia plus, and the bastards are still shutting them down. So the. Taxpayers are funding these banks, and yet the banks can't provide a service to a basic service to the taxpayer that's giving them that allows access. people to have certainty for their money, security from scammers, all those things that are essential for 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 and just basic service and all the the nuanced stuff, etc. You know, someone at the local branch who knows their business, a float for a cash float for their business. All those things that the little things that every day make society run. Not have they, to drive two hours to do it. Not have to drive. They couldn't give us stuff. It's grab, 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 grab for them. Mm. And people have got, like, you got to, we're going to win this campaign. If the first thing people do is, stand, is get off their knees and stand up and say, no, this is unacceptable. I'm not going to accept the BS that somehow I'm part of a general shift away from um, uh, branch banking into the into the internet, even though I don't really feel that way. But, but, but I'll let them talk them into thinking I'm the odd one out. Mm. No, no, it's rubbish it's that somehow the banks get to have the right to make commercial decisions. And yeah, I may not understand them, and it may inconvenience, inconvenience me as a support as a customer. Mm. And then I look around, and everyone else is complaining about the same thing. And you go, well, hang on. Every other business to run has to put the customer's desires first. Why don't these particular businesses have to put mm -hmm. the customer's desires first, right? And then, then you hear that the government actually gives them so much free money. Yeah, this is wrong. Get off your knees, stand up and join the fight, mm -hmm. right? Because you can't, it's a much bigger than just the, the insistence on branch services. The banking system, Elisa, creates the credit that drives the economy forward. And what's happened is the banking model has changed. We talk about this in the lead of this week's um, a magazine this week. The banking model has changed, whereas once upon a time, the way banks made money is they provide the credit that allowed their customers to make money and they got a share of that in interest. That's how banks made money. In other words, banks grew because the economy grew. Mm -hmm. Now banks are growing at the expense of the economy. And that's why we have a, the poster from the 1950s movie, The Blob, on there. They're growing. They're devouring the whole economy they make the, the, the profit margins they, they increases because they've found another way to cut this, cut that. And all the things they cut are the real things. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they have a, they have a toxic um, uh, gambling. gambling room <laughs> inside that where, where, they, where they just pour all their efforts into to make money out of just literally moving money around and gambling on it, right? And that's the way they want to do things. And the problem is the impotent government is sitting on its hands saying, well, that's the banking system. Mm. Fine. We can't do anything about that. Rubbish! <laughs> For 84 years, we had a government bank that set the standard of behaviour and service in Australia. We need to bring it back. That's what you do about it. Mm. And even shorter, and, and we should do that. Plus, if you're giving them free money, you put conditions on it. Right? You must serve the community. Immediate moratorium on all branch closures. 
Go around to all the ones for the last two years and make them open them up again. Go call those tellers that have lost their jobs and say, come back to work. You've got to serve your customers in your town. Mm. We're going to stop people having to drive 300 kilometre, 500 kilometre, 1,000 kilometre round trips to go see another bank. We're going to fix this. This is, a, this is what a government can do. Mm. We saw in COVID, governments exert enormous powers that people were really, oh boy, is this what you can do in an emergency? Yeah, in an emergency, governments can do it. Look at in a war. In an emergency governments, there's no limit on what governments can do. Well, that applies to banks as well. There's no limit on what they can do. Make them behave. Now, Parliament is sitting uh, starting from, I guess it's the 6th of February, and we want people to call their senators about this ahead of time because we want to get our inquiry into bank branch closures and the alternative of Post Office Bank up ASAP as yeah. soon as we can. So we put out the call in this media release and we'll be um, continuing to uh, hone the mobilisation. Well, the link will be below, but yeah, from now, well, you're watching this on site. So all this coming week, you've got 10 senators in your state. Call everyone and email everyone and tell them support the inquiry into the regional banking crisis, mm. right? And there are senators in there that have, that have got the ball and are running with it, and they will move the motion in that first sitting week to get the inquiry up. And I use an analogy this week in the office, Elisa, because people think, what are, you know, inquiries, inquiries. Well, at least when you've got an inquiry, what you're doing is you're shining a spotlight. If we were the government, we would have floodlights everywhere and there would be all light, or we would have the, the, the roofs open and all you would have is daylight. Right? And no one, none of these banks will be able to hide anywhere. Well, we're not the government, so we can't do that yet. But what we can do is, get, is force the parliament to set up these inquiries. And they're like the, 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 the sweeping searchlight that prisons use, and, and uh, etc., for, for security. And mm. so if you want to escape the prison, you've got to, you've got to make, wait till the light goes past, mm. etc. Right? And scurry. Or as Craig Isherwood says, what we're doing is pulling away the, the fridge, right? and exposing the cockroaches to light so they scurry. That's what you, and this is going to be a serious inquiry if we get it up. And you can listen to a show, Robbie did an hour and a half live show with Martin North on that. So they had a whole discussion with yeah. questions and so forth. So you can go to Walk the World to watch that. Um, but we have been, by the way, because if, you, if you've already called your senators and you want to do something else, Call your local council, go in and visit them, get them to do the same. We've been getting more engagement from councils. You've had some discussions in the last week or two with councillors and councils that are beginning to move. More of them are beginning to look at resolutions. We've councils already got 13 councils that pass resolutions because calling it, for this inquiry. And that, is, that itself, Elisa, reflects how serious this issue is because it's not, it's not just uh, you know, something councils are doing on a whim. You withdraw banking services, the functioning of the whole daily economy of that town, mm. of that community, yep. is completely constricted, right? And, and until we started this campaign, people were being sucked into thinking, oh, well, this is the evolution of technology, this is commercial. No, this is you being screwed yep. by people who should be held to put their feet to the fire, right? And councils are starting to get a sense of that and they're fighting back, and we, so join the fight back. And we can also say without details that there are senators that have engaged with local councils on this matter, so it is getting traction. Yeah, and one last thing, Elisa, back to ASIC, yep. because I just we'll put out a release about this. Um, but there was an article this week where, and I want to highlight it in relation to the banks, because the chairman of ASIC, Joe Longo, complained in the financial review about Senate estimates where he has to go and answer questions of senators. And he complained about being accountable to the parliament, right? We shouldn't have to be accountable like this to the parliament. And he's a regulator, right, who gives the banks whatever they want and he doesn't want to be democratically accountable to the parliament even though he runs a government agency. What he was, what he was reflecting is the fact, because it's, all the regulators in Australia, at least, are captured by the banks and they have the same mindset. They don't think they should be accountable to the government. They think the governments are accountable to them. They're above government. Mm -hmm. Government answers to them. They tell government what to do, right? And we've got to invert that. This is going to be an interesting... He's fired a shot across the bow for the ASIC inquiry, but what he's also reflecting is this club, this financial club that's got, that have got the game sewn up and rigged to suit themselves, right? And we are going to break that club down. 
because it's, it's, it's a cartel, it's an oligopoly, it shouldn't be allowed to exist. And that includes the banks themselves and that includes the regulators. We've got to change it all. Now, we'll go to our next topic. Uh, we've got a bit, bit to talk about there. God of war devouring more and more. So, uh, and I'll, I'll just uh, say, call in if you haven't before for a complimentary copy of the alert service. You can subscribe because the story we're about to talk about, or stories, uh, are featured in this week's alert service. We have a very special feature, which is um, the transcript of a presentation that former Australian ambassador to China, China John Lander, gave to the, an American organisation called the Committee for the Republic. And this is regarding um, the fact that Australia is being set up for war against China. Well, John's opening line was, because he, he put his thesis up front, he said, um, the United States is not preparing to go to war against China. The United States is preparing Australia to go to war against China. And then he backs up that very stark statement. But we've also published the introduction from the, the, um, the chairman of the Committee for the Republic, John Henry. Um, and it's a really good introduction where he points out that nobody is a threat to America. In the, nobody in the whole world is a threat. The United States is the most invincible force in a sense. I shouldn't say invincible, but you know what I mean. Uh, the, mo the most secure country in the history of the world, yet they, 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 they call everyone a threat. This is really powerful stuff. We'll put the link below. People should really take the time to watch this, watch John's presentation and watch this discussion because this is an Australian, a very accomplished, experienced, expert Australian in foreign affairs, John Lander, former ambassador, sending a message to the Americans that they never get otherwise. Mm -hmm. What they get from the Australian government is, oh, we're so afraid of Asia. We're so afraid of Asia. Please stay here and protect us. Mm. Please, please, please put more bases in. We've got to protect us, right? Who are you afraid of? Oh, we're afraid of China. Don't you have a relationship with China? Yeah, they're our biggest and best customer. We make hundreds of billions of dollars from them a year, but we're so afraid of them. We're going to put, we're going to put sea mines out there to protect our navigation, our trade routes from China. But hang on. Who are you trading with? China. You're going to protect your trade routes with China, from China, using CMI. Like, this is, this is insanity. This is, this is what the Australian government says with a straight face, what the media reports with a straight face, and the Americans just keep hearing this message. And for some of them, it's like, oh, well, we better go and help the Aussies then. And so here you've got a, a, an Aussie saying, sorry, America, we don't need that. We can, we can look at the world in a very different way. So mm. make sure you watch it. Now, the other discussion, uh, which is also covered in this week's and last week's Australian Alert Service at length, is that we're at a, another serious potential inflection point in regard to the situation in Ukraine and the push to keep this war dragging on and on perpetually. Um, firstly, this arose in regard to Japan, where the Prime Minister Kishida was just in the United States uh, meeting with President Biden, they issued a joint statement where the US went out of its way to say we're committed to the defence of Japan uh, against China, of course, and they expanded, um, there were ministerial meetings as well, to expand, discuss the expansion of Japanese engagement with NATO, the North American, uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organisation. Um, and this is via uh, partnership programs that Japan has with NATO and Asia-Pacific partners groups. But then add to that the fact that uh, there was a meeting this week between NATO and the European Union and they issued a joint declaration for a EU-NATO partnership. So this was signed off on on the 10th of January without any authorisation from the parliaments of the countries or participation from the peoples of those countries. And, of course, that there are joint... countries There are countries that are members of the EU, Elisa, that are not members of NATO. And this, this involved... They're, and they're, why are they members of NATO? Well, there's a reason they're not members of NATO. They don't want to be members of NATO, yet they're being dragged into this war effectively through this measure. Well, that's right. And the joint declaration that was issued, which talked about expanding and deeping, deepening um, cooperation to address the... Um, the challenges from authoritarian actors, namely Russia and China, actually encouraged the fullest possible involvement in this alliance, NATO-EU alliance, of non-NATO 
European Union countries. So they're actually expanding the net to sweep in all these countries. Yeah. Um, now, this coincided with a renewed drive to rearm Ukraine because, you know, some players from even the US, such as General Milley, have been saying, you know, use the winter period for with a lull in fighting to try to get negotiations on the table. But there are other players that definitely do not want that to occur. And one of them is former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who just made a flying visit over to meet with Zelensky in Kiev. And can, he had convinced, by the way, the Ukrainians and Zelensky personally not to enter into negotiations with Russia last April, just a couple of months after the in, initial incursion, had the special military operation had been launched by Russia, which likely would have succeeded in preventing this whole last year of war. He convinced Zelensky not to go ahead with that. So he was just there again and he pushed the Western countries, particularly the Americans, the Germans and the Poles, to supply these tanks that Ukraine wants, dozens of tanks and other heavy weaponry, which did not get agreed to at the recent meetings at the Ramstein Air Base in Germany, which were meetings by the Ukraine Defence Contact Group. And he attacked the Germans in particular and others for not going along with that. The fact that the Germans and even Americans didn't want to do this, despite all the propaganda of we stand with Ukraine stuff that we've heard for a year, is because cooler heads are saying this is insane. Mm. You're going to have to negotiate an end to this, right? What do we gain from constantly stirring it up. Well, I'll tell you what the thinking is. Let's let's play a clip right now. This is US Senator Lindsey Graham, just in the last little period. Look what he says. I like the structural path we're on here. As long as we help Ukraine with the weapons they need and the economic support, they will fight to the last person. And that's it, Elisa. This is, Lindsey Graham is one of these warmongering thugs in the US Senate who's responsible, who has personally pushed war after war after war for two decades, including in the Middle East, right? Regime change all over the place, etc. He and his old partner in crime, John McCain. And he let the cat out of the bag. This is about arming Ukraine so, because he, McCain, he, Lindsey Graham and the Americans want to fight, American neocons want to fight Russia. They want to destroy Russia. They've got someone to do it for them. Mm -hmm. Arm Ukraine to the last man, right? And Which this is, is what's laying the same thing out. John Lander was saying that they will use then Australia that's what, for. That's what they would do for us. Vis-a-vis -vis yeah. China if we let that happen. Um, now, Boris Johnson also demanded that Ukraine be immediately admitted to NATO. You know, any... Um, naysaying aside, just put it aside, let them join. Of course, that, that is World War Three. That well, that's happens. right, because that would mean Ukraine could invoke the collective defence provision of Article 5 of the NATO Charter, and all NATO countries would have to go to their defence and actually get rid of the proxy, directly fight Russia, yeah. essentially. Um, so in the wake of these Boris Johnson provocations, the US and Germany have both announced that they will now send the tanks that were being demanded. Zelensky has always already said it ain't enough, we need more, we need hundreds, not dozens. But the point is that um, it doesn't matter how many they send. You can't assure Ukrainian victory against Russia. And at the same time, they're ruling out, because the only way you end it is negotiation, but that's being ruled out because now the position that's being pushed by the Anglo-Americans is that the only basis for negotiations is if Russia pulls out from all the eastern, the self-governing eastern republics and from Crimea. Uh, the New York Times just had a commentary about this saying, you know, the um, Biden administration has refused to make Crimea a red line. In other words, Russia's got to get out of there. But it is now, quote, starting to soften to this. And it says that over the course of the conflict, the United States and its NATO allies have been steadily loosening the handcuffs they put on themselves, moving from providing javelins and stingers to advanced missile systems, Patriot air defence systems, armoured fighting vehicles and even some Western tanks to give Ukraine the capacity to strike against Russia's onslaught. 
um, and then they went through the discussions about providing HIMARS long-range rocket systems and Bradley armoured vehicles to potentially provide the basis for a Ukrainian attack to try and seize Crimea. Um, and the article said that the Biden administration is therefore moving closer to, quote, direct American help for Ukraine to go on the offence, including targeting Crimea. Um, so what this means, if they insist on that the only basis of negotiation is, you know, to Russia to give up Crimea as well as those eastern republics, that means a continuing dragged out war to weaken, as has been explicitly stated, to weaken Russia, um, to weaken China in the other example. The yeah. only countries that are standing up to the uh, Anglo-American, not only the geopolitical system, but the financial economic framework that is crushing people, just as we see in the example within Australia, the banks are part of that overall economic framework that are crushing citizens locally. Um, now, Christia Freeland raised this issue of the economy and how that intersects it at the Davos meeting that just occurred. And I'll just run this clip um, because essentially, you know, she, who is the Canadian finance minister uh, and has been very supportive of um, the Nazi elements within the Ukrainian government. But she's a direct descendant of them. That's the, right. Nazis from World War II in Ukraine moved to Canada and had a granddaughter named Christia Freeland. Um, so she's basically saying, look, you know, we have to enable Ukraine to defeat Russia as the only way to save the world economy. Um, so we'll run that clip. It's not about doing Ukraine favours um, that we're talking about. Supplying Ukraine with weapons, and as President Zelensky very crucially pointed out, supplying Ukraine with the money it needs to win the war is ultimately in our own self-interest. So I'm a finance minister, and if you were to say to me, what is the one thing that G7 finance ministers, G7 governments this year could do that's actually in our power, right? We don't control COVID. We don't control global supply chains. We don't control whether there will be immaculate disinflation or not. One thing where we have some real practical levers is we can help Ukraine win clearly, definitively. And if we do that, if that happens this year, you know it as well as I do, Fareed. That would be a huge boost to the global economy. So I do think Ukraine is going to win. Uh, and, you know, this also intersects with a speech that Lavrov gave, a press conference where he said, look, you know, the Anglo-American system is collapsing. They want to drag out the war as a means to keep their system going, right? So that the elites, the small percentage at the top, the golden billions, as they call them, as he called them, uh, are able to keep milking the, the system through military and other means, um, but on the other hand, Russia, China, the BRICS countries, uh, Eurasian Economic Union, a whole host of broadening arrangements are proposing an alternative economic framework that would um, actually dismantle that control system to provide uh, a fair and just economic architecture to rebuild countries, return to the policies such as national credit, as we talk about in the lead of the Australian Alert Service, to foster development, which benefits everybody. Yeah, and I'll, I will point out to the uh, the viewers, at least uh, two months ago maybe, they would remember when all the media was full of, oh, Ukraine's winning, Ukraine's winning, Ukraine's winning. It was rubbish at the time. All that had happened was the, the Russians had made a strategic retreat from one position and the Ukrainians were able to flood in and, and take, uh, take over that. But that, that was a, 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 sorry, a tactical retreat. All the people who are true experts have pointed that out. You're not hearing that now, the Ukraine's winning. What you're hearing is, we need more, because they're not winning. They're being massacred. Like, mm. I, I hate to use that term, but that's what war is. War yeah. is hell. We're going to put this picture yeah, up. Yeah, the graphic. But, this is, but, but th um, this is a war that started in 2014 with an American coup in, yeah. in, um, in, in uh, Kiev, right? It didn't start with a Russian invasion. The Russian action that we're seeing is a, is a continuation of that. And so it has to end by negotiation. 
and you're talking our side is fostering the, the most insane approach and they're only going to get away with it if we let them get away. So that's where it's, like, it's also like the banks, like I said, we we'll get off our knees and stand up and not accept what the banks are doing. Don't accept what our governments are doing in our name because they put a little Ukraine flag up there and say, oh, see, we're doing this out of the goodness of our heart. No, 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 they're not. War is hell. It's devouring the souls of all these people, right? And, it, and if, it, if it gets out of bounds, it's going gonna, it's gonna to destroy the whole world. Mm. And this is this is really serious stuff. You've got to call an end to it, but you've got to you've got to see the truth, and that means not just accepting what that that, that history started, you know, last February twenty fourth. Yeah, and we can put some links below to uh, our web pages that have further information on that whole backdrop, which we don't can't do justice to now. And please, so please watch John Lander's presentation. Share yeah, it. that's the best thing you can do when you get off this. Um, when you stop finish when you finish watching this video, because we're about <laughs> to wrap up. <laughs> Um, yeah, watch the video, call your senator, uh, contact us to get more engaged. That's uh, yeah, and another video, sorry, which is on our YouTube page, if you haven't seen it, it's a 14-minute video of Michael Sanderson's interaction with the oh, CEOs yeah. of the three banks before Christmas last year. Have a look at that as well and share that too. That's all we've got time for. Yep. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Lisa. And see you again next week. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.